back to week of prayer. I hope you guys have all been having a really amazing week this week. I invite you to join us as we worship and praise the Lord. Washing over all our sin, the people sing, the people sing, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna.
Thank you for worshiping with us. You may be seated. Almost like I didn't know where I was, just wandering up here, you know. Um, how's everyone doing this evening? Well, good. I spent a little time with the juniors this afternoon, at least a couple of sections of the juniors. Had a good time talking with them. Um, some of their questions revealed a lot about the juniors, let me tell you. Um, so, uh, anyways, we'll... we'll We'll counsel you about that later on. Um, well, it's been a, a pleasure to be with you guys here for the first three or four days of this week. Um, and one of the things, or the, the driving thing that we want to get to this week, is that there's no such thing as the right time or right place, only the right person, all right? And so um, one of the elements in being the right person is that you have to have mental strength, right? In whatever situation you find yourself in, you got to be able to think clearly. Paul and Silas had the ability in the, in the lowest situation possible to still somehow generate a smile to their face and even think about other people. Man, the, the things that make me forget about other people is crazy. Mental strength, that's number one. Number two, last night we talked about we, if we want to be the right people, we've got to surround ourselves with the right people, right? And in doing so, if we want to surround ourselves with the right people, what do we in turn have to do? We've got to treat them right. We've got to treat people right. Our relationships are paramount. The way we act to one another, that is, I don't know. The Bible says a lot about a lot of different things, but almost every single story is exclusively about the quality of relationships that we have. So I would argue that's probably one of the most, if not the most important thing to God, how we treat one another. Remember, even in the script it says, I'm going to divide you later on in life. And those of you who didn't treat people well, you're out. Those of you who treated people well, you're in. So I want to talk to you about the third thing tonight that I think is, is pretty important in becoming the right person. And that's morals. Have you built a list of things that are important to you? And when I say have you built a list of things, I mean, have you come up with what is most important? You know how some people will say like, hey... The last thing I would ever do, want to do, is hurt you. But you know what? That means it's still on the list, right? It's the last thing, but it's still on the list, right? So, what is your list? What is the last thing and the first thing? What drives your life? So, as a little boy, I've been trying to teach my son the idea of being polite and respectful. So... You know, as a young parent, or as a, as a parent with a young kid, I'm not that young, one of the things that I'm learning is that I don't want to just have good intentions with my boy. So when he gets in a situation in his life where he's demanding, you guys ever met anybody who's a little demanding? Okay. He'll demand something, right? And, and most little kids go through this stage, and some kids never grow out of it, unfortunately. So one of the things that I believe about parenting is that you have to train selfishness out of your kid. Because if you don't train selfishness out of, your, out of your kid, so like when they're little, right, what do they do? You're holding them, what do they try to do? They try to rip your glasses off your face. What's the first thing you say to them? Don't rip the glasses off my face. That's, that's not something you can just do, right? 
And if you don't train a kid not to rip the glasses off your face, when they become two, and you're still not training them not to be selfish, you have raised a little hellion. Because now they're mobile and can do all that stuff. And when they become 10, you have raised a jerk if they're selfish. And when they become 16, you have raised somebody that can drive around and turn everyone's life upside down. And have you ever played, some of you know what I'm talking about, any of the, any of the older generation here ever played basketball with a 55-year-old who's never been told no? So I'm working on my son. Son, how do we work, work some of the selfish nature that we're born with out of us? And so I've been working on him, right? And I'm like, uh, I'm like, hey, buddy, I need you to sound polite. He'll make a demand. And a lot of well-meaning people, after a little kid has made a demand, they'll be like, give me that sandwich. And a lot of people will say, like, what do you say? What do you say? No. You talk to me different. You don't just tack please on some rude demand and act like it was polite. Okay? So I'll tell him, hey, Jace, I don't care if you say please. A lot of rude people say please. I would like you to sound polite. Please craft me a new sentence. So, so one day we were sitting in church and I... Our church fellowships together outdoors every Sabbath until it gets too cold and then we go inside. But otherwise, we fellowship outdoors every Sabbath. And, and this was in the heart of COVID that we were outdoors. But I, Julie and I, my wife, had never told Jace, like, stay away from people. I, I wasn't really that concerned. And I didn't want to, like, generate a feeling for him that he needed to be afraid of people. So we had never really said anything, but we were sitting in church one day, and I, we're sitting in our, in our chairs, our lawn chairs. There's some people sitting behind us, I'm, I'm going to say 10 feet away. I knew them, fortunately, but my little guy, he's maybe four years old at this time, he says, Daddy, look at those people back there. They need to get away from us. Right? And he's not quiet. He's a four-year-old. So I'm like, I, 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 son, please, please don't say that. He's like, Daddy, but look at them. They are way too close to us. And I'm like, okay, listen, shh, please. Jace, can you, can you just stop saying this? And he's like, Daddy, you need to get those people away from us right now. So I, I grab him by his little collar, and I bring him in close to me, and I say, listen here, young man. You stop being rude right now. And I let him go. <laughs> and he stands back and he goes, Okay, Daddy, would you be willing to get those people away from us? <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, the place lost it. <laughs> just so many people. I, I, don't, I don't know if anybody could listen to the rest of what was going on. I mean, people just laughed and laughed and laughed. I'm like, you little brat, that's not the part that I was worried about you being rude. Um, but so I'm working on him, right? I want him to develop who he is. I want him to develop his moral compass because... When you start to look your life in the face and you have to make decisions, you need to know what to do. You're like, you have to know what to do. And you kind of have to know what to do. You should have thought about it hopefully a little bit before you get there, right? I want to talk to you about a story that's in the Bible where some individuals developed their moral compass, and it meant big changes for the world around them. I mean big changes for the world around them. 
If you'd get your script out with me again, this is in Daniel 3. Daniel 3. Anybody know what story this is? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's interesting. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel 3. I used to love this story because my dad would read it to me as a kid, and it's, it's actually kind of poetic, the way, they, the way this story was written. It says this, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high and 9 feet wide and set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, a lot of people have criticized the dimensions of this image because they say you can't build a statue like this or it would be so disproportionate it would look odd. So I was doing a little reading on this, doing a little research, and actually they believe that it was probably built a little more like our Statue of Liberty. So a lot of it was pedestal, and then you had at the very top, you have this image that's up, this golden image that's up top on, uh, you know, on the top of it. And in this particular thing, it says 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. But the actual, um, the actual measurement that they used back in the day was called cubits. All right, I saw you mouthing it. Good, good. So they used the, the actual measurement was called cubits. And a lot of people would feel like, see, the Bible's not relevant. Cubits aren't even a thing anymore. Anybody ever heard of measuring something in cubits? Okay. How many of you have ever measured something in cubits? Everybody, please raise your hand. Everyone in the room, please raise your hand. Cubits is a part of the sexagesimal system, which is what we tell time by. So that, that particular counting is something that dates all the way back. We get to see a little story that uses it in the Bible. We say to ourselves, is the Bible really relevant? Because what are the questions we need to ask ourselves when we read the Bible? What's it tell us about the culture and the people of the time? What does it tell us about God's what? God's principles. And if those principles, if we be, believe principles never change, what does it tell us about us? How can we apply the principles to us? So just a little nugget there to show you that there are elements of the Bible that are still very tangible for us today. We all use this counting system every time we tell time. He summoned the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the what? Anyone? Dedication of the image that he had set up. So the ta satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before it. Then the herald cried aloud, This is what you are commanded to do, people. As soon, this is verse 5, as soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all kind of music, you must fall down and worship. Worship. Have you guys ever been tricked before? When I, when, one time when I was reading this story, I said to myself, man, these people must have been pretty irritated to have been invited to a dedication, and once they got there, they were told, actually, this is a little more than a dedication. Now that you're here, we're not just celebrating and having a good time. You'll be bowing down and worshiping this. That's the kind of trickery that I don't like. Some of you might find that in relationships. You think it's one way, and somebody reveals themselves to be in the other, uh, another way. Some of you might find it in work. Somebody gives you some expectations, you sign on the dotted line. By the time you get to the job, the expectations are different. Now what do you do? 
These people were invited to a dedication. I'd go to a dedication. Well, cool, I heard there's this big golden image. I'd like to see that. I show up, and now I'm told to bow down and worship it. But not just that. If you bow down and worship, good. Verse 6, but whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Is it conceivable that you could be invited to a, a party that you thought would be one way? One of the questions the, junior asked, the juniors asked me today was, have you ever been asked to drink or do drugs? And if so, how do you deal with that peer pressure? I mean, that's tough. As a 45-year-old, I'm like, dude, shut up. Leave me alone. I'm not interested in your thing that you think is cool. But I've got a few years on you to not care what other people think. I get it. It's hard to grow and you want to be socially acceptable. But at some point, you just have to say like, hey, what's important to you is not important to me. I'm happy to hang out, but I don't want your drugs and I don't want your drink. When life starts to threaten us, because that starts to get hot, right, when you get put on the spot. Somebody asks you something you're not comfortable answering anymore. Beads of sweat, they start to form on the forehead. See, these people were dealing with literal heat. But you know how hot it gets when you start to feel like the social outcast? Some of you will never even put yourself in that situation. And what I mean by that? is some of you will be careful to never have to stand up for anything so that you won't be scrutinized. That's going to mean you're going to lead a rough life later on when life asks you, in fact demands of you, that you have a moral compass. You ever played... Basketball with a 55-year-old who hasn't been told no. Have you ever worked with one who is dishonest? You can't become a grown-up and have no idea who you are. Your life will be miserable. You will make the lives of the people around you miserable. Grown-ups, am I telling you something new? No, but guess what? We forget it. I'm probably not even telling you guys as youngsters anything new, but we forget it. That's one thing I love about the script. It reminds us of things that we already know, but forget. You'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. Therefore, as, here, as soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, and all kinds of music, all the people's nations and men of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. I want to take another little pause right here. If I gave you that list of musical instruments, what, would you, what type of concert would you think that you're going to hear? A what? I heard it. Say again? A classical concert. This was one of my big issues with people as I was growing up. I was never allowed to listen to popular music when I was in high school because I went to a self-supporting boarding academy and everything you do there is illegal. So I was never allowed to listen to the music of the time because, you know, it's wrong. But you know what I was allowed to listen to? Classical music. One day I was reading this when I was in high school and I said to our music teacher, why, why do I have to listen to classical music? I mean... You're claiming that this music that I like to listen to is of the devil, but these people were worshiping an image to it. He wasn't happy with me, I would say. Um, you know, you can take a look over in the Psalms, and David talks about praising the Lord with cymbals and drums and all kinds of other music. So I took him to that verse. He again, not very happy with me. In fact, I was told one time by a, by a teacher that I was pushing back on with some of these concepts. I don't need to argue with you. You're the student and I'm the teacher. It just warmed my heart to know the difference. 
Music is something you have to be wise about. There is no doubt. But use your mind to think about what is right and what is wrong, not just what people tell you. Somebody asked in our classes today, what should I do with music that has explicit lyrics? My guess is that if you're asking, you already know the answer. At this time, some Chaldeans or astrologers came forward and they denounced the Jews. They said to the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, live forever. You, you have issued this decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound, the classical music, of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all kinds of music should fall down and worship the image of gold. And whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown immediately into the blazing fiery furnace. But there are some Jews who you have set over your affairs in the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They don't pay any attention to you, king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the, the image of gold that you have set up. Can I tell you something right now? I hate Chaldeans. Chaldeans are the kind of people that take a look around the room and they see, ah, someone is standing up for what they believe. I will tear them down. And it's hard to outlive that. Remember when we talked about Moses? Moses was afraid of that peer pressure too because Moses had spent 40 years changing and was still worried that he could not live down his reputation. Does anybody in this room want to be a better version of themselves at the end of the day than at the beginning of the day, but somewhere deep down inside, you can't convince yourself to do it because people already have an expectation? At some point, though, you've got to stand up and do it. I'll tell you, my time, like I said, my time in high school was, was, was rough. We had a dress code much like yours. I never wanted to wear the dress code, but we had to wear a collared shirt, a polo. It didn't have a logo on it. I guess our school was too poor for such things. So we had to wear a collared shirt and some sort of khaki pants, a belt, tucked in. We could wear whatever shoes we wanted anyways. So what I would do is I would go over to the Samaritan Center before going back to school, and I would buy some old polos and I would just cut the collar out of them and then I would wear a t-shirt to school and tuck the collar into the shirt so that technically I had a collar on and I had this one teacher who was on to me you know I came into his class one day and um, he was like uh, Mr. Foster that is not a collared shirt I'm going to invite you to go back and change and if you had to go back and change you got a, like a, an attendance point right and after you get so many attendance points, you would have a day of in-school suspension. So I went back, and I knew I had this attendance thing, and I was right on the edge, right? So I went back, I changed my shirt. Another day I come into class. Oh, no, I take that back. The collar day, and this is so stupid, right? I went back to the dorm, and I found a duster. Yeah, you guys don't even know what that is, all right? cool kid. I was a cool kid. Had a duster. And um, a duster is like what a cowboy wears. And they have that collar on it that like comes way out to here. So I, so I threw a polo on and then I, and then I pulled that collar up around me. I mean like so big. And I came in and I sat down like stiff as a board in the class. And my teacher was like, I mean he just starts writing frantically. Unbelievable. You know, and so there was a little meeting about my conduct. I want to say it was like the next day, not that long after, I came in and, and le legitimately I wasn't even trying to do anything wrong, but I had forgotten to put on a belt. And I mean, I, the glee in his eyes, he was like, um, <laughs> Mr. Foster, you don't have a belt on. Go back and change. 
And I knew, man, I knew it was like my last strike, right? So have you guys ever heard of a weight belt? So I come back, and I don't, 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 so I come back, I've got the weight belt on, he is riding frantically. I knew this was my last strike, I was going to have a suspension now. So <laughs> he starts riding frantically, hmm, hmm, and I said, uh, excuse me, we'll call him Mr. Doofy. Hey, Mr. Doofy, um, just to protect his name, are you writing about me? He's like, I am. I'm writing about the manner in which you came into my classroom. And I'm telling you, man, I had, I had the worst attitude. I mean, it was so, I made my life so much harder because I was so stupid. I said, well then, Mr. Doofy, you can write about the way I left your classroom as well. And I threw my books on the floor and I left. No. Now, I admit, I admit, it's a fun story to reflect on. But you know what is not fun? Even the in-school suspension is okay. It's just time. You can always change, right? You can always be different, which I fortunately was able to do so. The hard part of this story is when your grandfather who you idolize with all your heart because your grandfather is a great man. I mean, like I'm telling you right now, my, my grandfather was the kind of person where if you had a problem with Bill Foster, you were the problem. I mean, a great man. He was working for the school at the time. And they invited him to be a part of the discipline committee. And when I had to go in there and face him and see the look on this great man's face because I couldn't put a, the proper shirt on or wear a belt, and then when I was asked to do so, and not like it was a secret, right? It's not like this was new news. It's not like I came to that school that day and they had changed the rules on me. When I had to describe the disrespect, and I'm not saying my teacher was some kind of awesome great guy either. Uh, he, had his, he, he had his faults with how he dealt with students. He's human. When I had to look into the teary eyes of my grandfather and describe how I was, it made me want to be different. I wanted to be different. I left school that year. They didn't kick me out somehow. They just gave me the suspension, said they'd keep working with me. I went out, I got, a, I got a job where, believe it or not, did you know they had a dress code? <gasps> I got a job. I came back the next year, and I had a teacher, a different teacher, who I also had some tension with in previous interactions. That teacher had some expectations of me. He expected me to do this kind of stuff again. But over the course of the summer, I had grown a little bit. I wasn't perfect, but I had grown a little bit. And one day he was getting on to me about something, something that, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be a jerk. I wasn't trying to make waves. But finally, one day after school, I said, um, we'll call him Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones, could I speak with you for a moment? He said, sure. I pulled him aside and I said, hey, Mr. Jones, um, it, it isn't lost on me that I have been a difficult student to deal with. I said, but I want to turn over a new leaf, and I need you to let me. And to his credit, he said, I will do just that. He listened to my plea to want to be different. Moses took 40 years of change. Fortunately for me, it was a few small things. I mean, a lot of other stuff as well. But in that respect, a little summer of responsibility and a little time to wake up a little bit and want to be and do something different. We have to know who we are and how we're changing. I said this to the juniors today. If you are not growing, you are dying. 
If your relationships are not growing, they are dying. I didn't want to be, I didn't want the, the best years of my life to just be high school. I wanted to keep growing, and I realized that. Thank the Lord I realized that while looking into the eyes of my grandfather, who was disappointed in how I was. I needed to have a better moral compass and to know what to do with my own decisions long before I found myself in the situation. Here are three guys who knew about it. These Chaldeans, again, who I hate because they just want to tear people down who are trying to make changes, trying to stand up for what's right. Furious with rage, it says, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And have anybody ever wondered, do you know what their real names were? Ananias, Mishael, and and Azariah. Do you know why we don't call them by their names in this book? Say what? Yeah, but why did the Babylonians change their name? Yeah. So that's actually a really good answer. The reality is, is those people wanted to make sure that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lost their identity. So they started calling them something else. Some of us will do that to each other in this room. We will tear somebody down for who they are, even a little bit subconsciously, We'll tear them down for who they are with the hope that we can beat them into submission, that they'll be quiet, that they'll be different. And you know what? It's not always because they're liars or because they're mean. I would probably be okay if you had a bully in the school that people were like, no, absolutely not, not in our school. That would be one thing to put a stop to. But a lot of people... They want to put a stop to it because you're a little socially awkward. Or you like something I don't like. Or you're different. That's where we start to lose our mind. We become a mob and we start tearing people down. I don't want to be a Chaldean. I don't want to strip somebody of their identity because I want them to be different. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them in his rage, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, listen. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if not, but if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the burning fiery furnace. Then, and he asked this question, which I think is probably rhetorical, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? What God will be able to rescue you from my hand, he says. So then Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves in this matter. We don't need to try your drugs or your beer to prove that we're cool. We don't need to do the job description that we didn't agree to just to save face at this company. We don't have to do this thing that you're threatening with us, threatening us with, because we know who we are. You can call us by a different name if you want, but we are who we are. We don't have to be careful to answer you in this matter. If we are thrown into the furnace, the God we save is the God we serve is able to save us. We believe he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if we he doesn't, know that we will not do this thing. You don't have to ask again. Are any of us that strong? Would I be that strong? I am skeptical.
Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and even his face changed. You ever seen somebody, like, lose their mind? I mean, you're like, whoa, who is that? Okay? Um, my dad used to be like that when he would drive. Um, he would get pretty worked up over the other drivers. Any, any men in the room resonate here? Okay? You're a normal person. Give the shirt off of your back, right, for another person. But, boy, you get behind the wheel of the car, you'll rip the shirt off someone's back. His face changed. When you threaten somebody with not doing what they want, his face changed. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. You know what's so foolish about that? Seven times hotter. The burning fiery furnace was seven times hotter. Anybody ever use a matchbook to light a match? Yeah. When, my, when I was a little boy, my grandfather taught me to light a match with a matchbook, right? You have to hold your finger on the hot part of the match and strike it. And as soon as you do, you got to pull your finger out of the way. So that what? The match, as big as it is, doesn't burn a hole in your finger. I mean, if a furnace is hot enough to burn you up at one time hotter, why seven more times? I mean, burnt is burnt, in my opinion. I don't, you know, I mean, I guess there's broiled and charbroiled. I guess that's the way uh, Nebuchadnezzar liked his dissenters. So, seven times hotter, he said. And then throw them in. So these men, wearing their robes, their trousers, their turbans, and other clothes, they were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is why I don't like Chaldeans. Chaldeans are the kind of persons that want to tear somebody down for standing up for what's right, but they always create collateral damage. They're always hurting other people that they didn't even intend to because they just see the world so selfishly. I do not want to be a Chaldean, and sometimes I'm tempted to do it. You think these soldiers woke up that morning saying to themselves, today would be a good day to burn to death. I certainly hope there's some Chaldeans out there. Blah, 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 blah. No! And I would hope that in a school like this, in a Christian school, I would hope it would be hard to be a Chaldean here. And that somebody else might say to you, hey, cool it. That's not what we do here. It killed those soldiers. The king's command was so urgent... And the furnace so hot, this is verse 22, that the flames killed the soldiers who took them up. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that were tied up and thrown into the fire? They replied, certainly, O king, whatever you say. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. And this is an interesting line from a king. I mean, kings love to hear themselves talk. This is a man who had just built a 90-foot image to honor himself. He says, servants... Of the most high God. Come out of the fire. And come over here. Boy what a change. When three men were willing to stand up and say this is who we are. We know what our moral compass is like. Our minds are strong. Our friendships are strong. Our moral compass is intact. We are 
the right people. Let me tell you where the wrong place is at the wrong time. That's standing in the middle of the burning fiery furnace. But when you are the right person, it doesn't matter. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had worked on being strong people with great friendships who knew who they were. Come out here, the king says. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and royal, royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Singed. Their robes were not scorched, and this is the part I really like about this. And there was no smell of fire on them. You guys ever go camping? How many of you roll around in the fire when you're camping? Anyone? Okay, we got one or two idiots. That's fine. That's fine. Um, staff, please take note that there are some individuals in the group that need counseling. Um, I like to go camping. You know, as a, I was a dean for 13 years. And inevitably, there would be a trip, right? And the students would come to my door. They would say, Dean J, that's what they always call me. Dean J, can we borrow a sleeping bag? And you know, I would lovingly say, heck no. You may not borrow my sleeping bag. You know what I don't loan? I don't loan my toothbrush. I don't loan my underwear. And I don't loan my sleeping bag to some stank-footed teenager <laughs> who showers once a month. And then wants to come and sleep with your nasty feet at the bottom of my sleeping bag. Absolutely not. My sleeping bag is reserved for myself. I take my sleeping bag camping for me to get in. Not you. You may sleep in a sheet <laughs> if you need to, but not in my sleeping bag. I take my sleeping bag camping with me. And you know what happens? I don't, I don't sleep in the fire. I sleep in the tent that's not really even near the fire usually because you don't want the sparks to burn holes in your tent. So I go, I get back in the sleeping bag, then I pack everything up, I go home, I, I hike out, I pack it up, I put it in the car, we go hundreds of miles away from the fire, I get it back out, and when I open up the sleeping bag, what does it smell like? Fire. Not feet. My feet are clean, thank you. <laughs> that is why I do not share the sleeping bag. My clothes still smell like fire. My sleeping bag still smells like fire. The tent still smells like fire. This little point that the Bible makes is so fascinating. It says, even the smell of fire was not on them. See, when you are working on being the right person, when you, when you, when you say to yourself, how do I become mentally strong? How do I surround myself with the people that make me successful and eliminate the enemies of my success? When I build my moral compass to the point where I know who I am, and then I'm in a situation where I have to stand up for what is right, God says, I will stand with you to the point that not only will the fire not burn you, but you will not even smell like it. You see, I created the sun. One time, seven times hotter, those things mean nothing to me. I can protect you in this environment if you will stand for me. That is the power that we have at our fingertips if we are seeking to be the right people. There is no such thing as the right place or the right time. Just the right people. And how did that impact the world around them? Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has set his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except for their own. And this is where these kings, they, they, it's like they lose their mind. Therefore I make a decree 
So now he, he, he goes from like wanting to throw people in the furnace for not worshiping him. Listen to these fools. Therefore, I make a decree that the people and nations and languages who say anything against the God of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they'll be cut into pieces and their houses will be turned into piles of rubble. And this is his reason. For no other God can save the way this God can. That's what you have access to, ladies and gentlemen. The ability to become the right type of person, developing your mental strength and your relationships and your family and your friends, and hopefully you are starting to imagine what a moral compass looks like that allows you to stand for who you will know that you are. As we pray together tonight, I want to invite the music team forward. If you'd bow your heads with me, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would prick our hearts with the things that we need to do in our lives to be the right people. Maybe for some of us, we're not thinking carefully enough about our lives. We need stronger minds. Maybe for some of us, we recognize that we're not fostering good relationships and good connections with people that would help make a make us be successful. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to know how to sort and navigate that. And Lord, I pray that tonight we would start to think about what it is we stand for and who we are. When life begins to ask us questions, will we know the answer? Thank you for your spirit in this school and in the lives of these students and faculty and family and friends, we pray for your guidance and your spirit in our lives. In your name, amen.
sinner be still earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal sing it out so lay down your bread Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and that we can be here at Week of Prayer. And thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Please be with us as it's almost the end of the week. And please help us to sleep well tonight. And we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for singing with us. You are dismissed.